thank you very much, Oliver. Um, and yes, hello everyone, and thank you for taking the time to join today's session. Um, as you can hopefully see on the screen here, um, we're actually going to be talking about um, variations around cloud cost and risk management. We're taking maybe a particular focus here from an enterprise architect's viewpoint. Um, so we'll be going through some of the steps that you should be considering um, and also some of the different migration strategies that are out there that you can use as well. Before jumping into that, it is probably worth giving a quick overview of who we are as Evolution. Um, so we supply an enterprise architecture tool and the, the leader in the market here um, for the use of Abacus. And essentially what we allow our customers to do is to use Abacus to build different scenarios within their organization, use Abacus for modeling different situations, whether that's transformational projects, process management, portfolio management. And we've done this across various industries, across various regions, um, and as you can see here, over 3,000 different companies as well. My particular role, and I've been here for about eight years or so, so almost halfway for what Evolution has been going for the past 20 years. Um, and I help customers obviously try to identify the issues that they're having um, and use Abacus to try to solve those. Um, but don't worry, today isn't really a tool pitch, and we are going to be jumping into some of the areas around cloud migration, around cloud transformation, which is just one of the topics or even one of the use cases that we see customers using these days. So when it comes to cloud, um, I think there is um, an acknowledgement out there around, I guess, the complexity that cloud tends to bring. Um, and I guess some of the challenges that are there within cloud as well. One of the main things to consider when it comes to cloud, of course, is it's usually something like a migration effort. So what we really mean by that is organizations are trying to move things, whether that's on-premise content, whether that's data, services, or systems that they use, into a cloud-based infrastructure. So really, what that means in terms of today's world, over the past year and a half, cloud has obviously shot up in popularity, um, and it's really what most customers and organizations have been using to deliver the ongoing services that they couldn't have done due to things like COVID. Um, impacting things like their on-premise um, data models and systems that they were using. Now, cloud has been around for a while. Um, one of the things that we'll typically see throughout this are the different benefits or risks that come with cloud. Um, it's been around for enough time now that the good news is we know what a bad migration or a bad transformational project looks like. So we know what means from a successful perspective for any projects or programs that we're working on. And that's something we'll talk about later, how cloud can actually benefit you going forward as well. More specifically, we're gonna be talking about cost and risk today. Now, these are just some of the initial concerns around things like cloud migrations. And one of them is costs not being known up front. So you can see here almost 40% hadn't realized the total cost of cloud. So we'll be diving into that in a bit more detail. But there are also security concerns. And of course, there are things that lead us to move and work on cloud migrations that have been unforeseen. So these unforeseen factors will come out during the discussions we have about the risks that we should be aware of and also the costs that are in play as well. So of course, what that leads to is this analysis of risk versus cost. Now, cost and risk is something that we have, I guess, managed to, to work with in different industries and different domains. Um, but if you take a look at this example here, this is a great idea of how people tend to think of a problem and then how that tends to lead to the impact of their solution, really. This particular example comes from the Apollo missions, which was around 67, I believe, probably up to about 70, 72. And this was a quote from one of the astronauts there, Alan Shepard. And his quote was, it's a sobering feeling to be in space and realize that one safety factor was determined by the lowest bidder on a government contract. Now, in this particular situation, there were two parties at play. NASA finance wants to reduce costs and astronauts want to have a safe rocket. Now, in reality, they're both right. 
what NASA really lacked though was a comprehensive way of actually managing this process, managing the trade-offs to build an appropriate solution. Now, evidently by um, the incidents in Apollo 13, that tend to incur more risk, and in that case, certainly more cost. If you bring that back to a business world, this is exactly the same situation we're in, where we're trying to balance cost and risk. And Gartner states this explicitly here, where they found that organizations are typically overspending by 70% of more. Now, overspending um, is an interesting category. Um, and what I want to do is go through a quick example of what something like an overspending situation looks like. And when we say overspending, one of the best ways of actually representing this are the differences here between this blue line, which is the cloud costs to date, and this yellow line, which is the in-house, or we might classify as on-premise costs. And when it comes to cost, one of the important factors is not just to consider cost itself, but also TCO, the total cost of ownership. If we just look at cost, what we're actually seeing is that on-premise is cheaper than cloud. And of course, in certain situations, it might be. But what we might be deeming as the cost here for on-premise are the boxes we're buying. And what we're deeming as the cost for cloud here is maybe a 24 seven on-demand service that we've set up. Now, in reality, of course, that's not the whole picture. If we really think about what the on-premise cost is, it's the cost of those boxes, but then we also have an IT team behind that. We have insurances, we have disaster recovery, all of those feed into on-premise costs. Take that a step further, and now, of course, we've got to think about the power, the support, the heating, the cooling. More importantly, and which is something that I guess not ignored, but not so well known, is that then we have to have applications and servers that support the applications and servers that we already have. And that cost then feeds into that TCO. If we keep adding these up, we're gonna get closer to a tipping point here. Now on premise, we might be thinking about things like capacity planning. So we might be building for a peak plus a buffer. So of course we're trying to manage risk here as well. And traditionally on premise, if we do want to decommission, that's also going to cost us money as well. So in reality, if you really think about cost of on-premise, you have to also consider all of these other cost factors. Now, again, we could do exactly the same thing for our cloud situation. Yes, we might be running a, a 24 seven on-demand service, but again, practicalities mean that we should be speaking to our cloud providers. The idea of cloud is that you should pay for what you use and not plan ahead and pay for what you might use. With the ease and the speed that cloud can actually scale these days, you're paying for things on demand. So you apply a utilization rate across your cloud platform, and then suddenly you're maybe utilizing things like reserved instances, spot services from different providers. And this is why it's important when it comes to cost to actually consider all facets and all areas of those cloud migrations and the on-premise situations that you have. Now, it's not always going to be the case, of course, where cloud costs are cheaper, but this is typically the point where people have been underestimating or maybe even overestimating the cost of cloud versus on-premise because they might not know all of the information at that time. So again, when it comes to cloud, make sure you're building the right service for the right purpose. So there's inherent risk in this as well. So cost alone in terms of what's required is just one concern. And risk, of course, could be financial risk. You know, one of the things that's quite evident these days are things like data breaches. And the average cost of a data breach globally is, is 3.86 million, as you can see by the figures here. But really what we'll actually find is that organizations can start addressing these risks. If we can actually address breaches within a certain amount of timeframes, then of course we can typically save um, a significant amount of money. And cloud security can also seem resource intensive and it might seem expensive, but really when you view it from one of these lenses where you're actually saving money, it's a really cost effective investment with usually an inevitable ROI as well. 
Security also comes down to another key factor. You know, typically we think of things like the technology which makes things unsecure, but clouds are usually secure. The question you should be asking yourself is, are you actually using them securely? Now, if we look at the biggest concerns around security, which is just one of the risks, there are different categories that these security issues fall into. So in 2020, there was a cloud security report, and you can see here the highest ranking threat around cloud security was misconfiguration. It's not the technology itself, it's the way it's actually being configured by users, by people. This was actually up by 62% from the previous year. So it's not something that's going away. And again, it's how you use cloud. It's not just the use of cloud. So as powerful as innovative cloud actually is, it is of course complex and ever-changing. And from a security standpoint, you really should be trying to keep on top of all of these challenges or loopholes that you might find. The other key aspect around risk, however, isn't just security. In a similar way to costs, where we were talking about the power, the heating, the cooling, Risk also forms different perspectives. So risk could be financial management, but it's often compliance, it's security, it's the service, it's the culture, it's the quality of what we're providing. Risk should be analyzed in a very similar way, in a multifaceted way, just as we've done for costs. So it's clear cost and risk are paramount, but really what do we actually use as a solution to this? Well, for architects on the call, we're lucky because it just means being better at architecturing and planning for these things. The acknowledgement is there that the cloud, of course, is useful. Everyone knows it can be and usually is complex. So really what we should be doing is discussing the various aspects of cloud, making sure that we have the right architecture in place and making sure that we're planning for these cloud migrations. Before talking about the key steps that we as architects can take to kind of discuss these areas and help with planning, um, it probably is worth begging the question first of why cloud? What are the actual benefits that we get from moving aspects to cloud? So on the right hand side here, we've highlighted a few of these. Um, usually one of the first ones in terms of, um, we've got flexibility and portability listed here, but it's also scalability. You know. Traditionally, where you might have on-premise systems, cloud means you can start delivering services in different regions globally. Now, of course, there are other risks um, involved with providing services globally, but scalability is one of the key benefits. Some people maybe usually aren't aware of the benefits either. So it's clear that we should be highlighting these as we go through and making sure that when we move to cloud, we're actually indicating, are we getting a benefit from moving or are we doing it just for the sake of it? So it's often the case, it's really good practice to start with the end point you want to achieve. So you should be asking yourself, what kind of information do we need? What KPIs are gonna be the most powerful for informing and influencing the decisions here? So this is really what you should be aiming to pull together. And we'll discuss that in a few minutes of the best approaches. Now, this is true in the real world as well, of course, if you take something like Salesforce, um, the benefits are hopefully quite evident in terms of the use of these cloud services. So again, benefits could be financial, customer related. It could be about your market brand, your corporate or your quality. Each of these defining points that we mentioned around benefits, cost and risk should always be broken down into subsections again. So I think we're getting to a stage where it's becoming more evident, I guess, um, that certainly, like I mentioned earlier on in the last year, cloud has become one of the most important aspects to consider. It's no longer necessarily a trend. It's usually a must to survive. So how do we actually set our course? How do we actually go about moving towards a cloud infrastructure? So there are five steps that we've listed here. We'll walk you through the business case preparation. Then we'll look at how we can actually gather this information and go through these different design phases. We'll touch on the migration strategies that exist specifically around cloud migration, and then how we can actually communicate this throughout the organization. But three and four on this list tend to happen iteratively. So we can really start grouping these things together 
and they end up becoming almost like their mini own migration projects as well. But let's start with that first one, the business case and the preparation. So it goes without saying that cloud migration should be both a business and an IT priority. It isn't just about the technology that we're putting in place. It's about the benefits that brings to the business, what outcomes we get from moving to cloud. So really at the start, there has to be some kind of common understanding. What's the end goal? Not just a blanket statement of, can we migrate this to cloud? You know, it doesn't really benefit anyone internally. So the first thing is just to lay out that plan. You want to link to specific organization goals, but again, whether that's cost reduction, employee experience, competitiveness, all of these are specific goals that we're trying to achieve. Really, when we're talking about benefits, we should also be looking at trying to adopt a more of a, a proof of concept mind frame. We don't always have to go through a wholesale migration. And what lines of businesses can we work with to trial these environments before going through a complete migration? So it's about setting up that plan and then making sure that there's a, a clear direction for that. So especially when it comes to road mapping, and um, this usually has some kind of concept of time in there as well, but we really should be trying to identify what are we trying to achieve and when do we think we're going to get there. And roadmaps, of course, help you track each of these areas. Road mapping itself is, is probably quite a loaded term and you've probably um, heard us talk about road mapping before, so I won't go into too much detail on this here now, um, but really think about road mapping in separate domains as well. You know, you might have technology roadmaps, infrastructure roadmaps. Yes, these are all likely impacting each other, but there doesn't need to just be one overall roadmap that the organization is adhering to. You want to make sure that you can actually adapt and tailor these to any changes that tend to come up over time. So no roadmap is set in stone. They're there for guidance only. Next is portfolio analysis. So the business case is there, of course, to give us an understanding of what we want to do. Portfolio analysis is really about trying to gather that information at the beginning. So it's really important that we get over this first hurdle of building a good data set. And data sets could, of course, span across applications you use, infrastructure, processes, all of the things that tick the organization and deliver the capabilities that you have. Without a good data set, the architecture team really is flying blind here. So you want to make sure that you do assess the current state and have something in place that is workable. A lot of this work tends to be data discovery. So you want to start building good relationships with these lines of business, having integrations throughout your organization where you can pull all of this information into a central source, having co-ownership of information. So making sure this is readable and updatable by different users and then maybe even applying some kind of machine learning or algorithmic approach to get some of those answers. Now, when we do assess the current state, all of these different areas should be up for consideration. So there are a lot of factors across the organization and cloud migration projects can be complex. We're not just thinking about data, we're thinking about the systems we're migrating, the users of that data, as we've already mentioned, the security considerations, more so integrations. It's typically gonna be a little more difficult to build those integrations if everything had always been on-premise. So each of these areas should be checked beforehand. So business considerations could be things like the criticality of the systems we're using. Are these cloud solutions actually gonna be accepted by those business owners? From a networking perspective or from a technology perspective, do we need high availability and disaster recovery in place? Can we split applications into modular services? Do we need to wholesale push an application to a cloud-based infrastructure? We're thinking about things like single sign-on and continuous monitoring for security and also data considerations. What traditionally would have been an on-premise solution within a specific region, Cloud allows us to span across multiple regions. So that means that we have to consider where that data is stored. It might be in the UK and Europe right now, but any services we deliver across Asia or America 
data considerations need to be made there as well. And of course, around integrations, there are dependencies between systems. Um, you've heard us talk about this idea of picking up a pizza slice and all the strands of cheese that come along with it. It's exactly the same when you're trying to lift and shift something to cloud. Think of all those integrations that exist. What are the dependencies and who and what is going to be impacted by these transformations? Now, that's a lot of data, but really you should only be focusing, of course, on the things that are important. And we should be thinking about less manual ways of gathering the data. So yes, we could walk up to someone and ask them, or in these days, maybe ask them over Teams. But really, when there are lots of lists of information, lots of spreadsheets, it's going to be much easier just to centralize this. We might send out surveys to collect some of this information. But really, we're trying to build up a key repository, again, where there's co-ownership of this data. You know, make this available to users, make it editable though to those users, and make sure you move away from every team member almost having their own version of their view of the world on their laptops. You can push that a step further and you can move into more of a machine learning approach. So machine learning is just really one of those things that we would use to explain the unexplainable. So it's, a, it's quite a good tagline to use because really what we're trying to emphasize through machine learning is once you've gathered some of that data, there may be some blank cells, there's some blank values. So we could ask people to fill that in, or we could use machine learning to actually implement something that scans our information and suggests what those values could be. Machine learning hopefully isn't anything too new either. You know, major companies use machine learning in various different ways. Amazon uses it for reviews. PayPal uses it for fraud detection. Um, there are various benefits that you can get from using machine learning. It's making sure that you apply it in the right context. So really what it's trying to do is just remove the guesswork out of some of the decisions that you're trying to make. It's also an interesting people problem. So typically people are more likely to start correcting data they think is incorrect because they think that requires less effort than filling in a blank cell. So it's also a great way of gamifying some of the objects that you have, some of the attributes that you're capturing, and then really trying to get the team on board. And again, what machine learning does here is start to try and answer those questions, you know, maybe systems that are using um, the same capabilities perhaps, or two systems that behave in the same fashion. Those might be good candidates to move to cloud because there are already cloud providers that provide similar services. So it's making sure that you use the data that you have and start filling in the blanks with something like machine learning. So within that portfolio management section, that's where we're actually capturing the information. Now I've quickly touched there on the attributes that we should be considering, but really what that leads to is identifying the main KPIs. And the design phase really does go hand in hand with that portfolio discovery phase as well. So we want to make sure that as we collect the information, we're collecting the right information. So try to focus on a few core metrics that you want to show your audience, show your stakeholders. And these could, of course, be the key things that um, shape that cloud migration strategy. Whether it's network usage, on-demand plans, whether we need disaster recovery in place, what the KPIs we're trying to hit here. So focus on a few key metrics, provide a clear direction for where you actually want to go with these. And that then allows you to build some kind of compelling case for this. Now, when it comes to these metrics, you really can spend a lot of time deciding on what you should be choosing. And the word of warning here again is focus. And we've had a number of customers ours um, who have provided various WebExes um, talk about focus of metrics. And when it comes to deciding what you should be doing, sometimes it's often good to understand what you shouldn't be doing. And the four tips that you'll find across the various other webinars we've done is try not to collect every field imaginable. You're not trying to build the perfect data set. You're trying to build just enough to deal with this specific cloud transformation project. There's some general rules around the type of information you should be gathering as well. 
for example, try to avoid things like free text fields. We want to be as objective as we can when we start building our um, algorithms and when we start producing our KPIs. So we want to make sure that we have a clear idea of what we actually capture. And the two final ones is don't collect data that you don't have a use for. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Always ask why. Why are we wanting to know cost information? Why do we want to know how many users there are? Why do we want to know which dependencies there are? And these could all be valid questions for a cloud migration project, but maybe not so for something like a process optimization transformation project. So again, select your metrics on the use cases that you have. And then finally, don't attempt to collect the data that you have no source for. Trying to collect information, let's say as an example, maybe a sentiment towards a specific application you've done, but you've never done a survey to see what the application is like internally, you're likely going to trip yourself up going down the line. So have focus on the metrics that you want. And then after consideration, you'll narrow down to some of the few. Now, once you've collected those metrics, we're starting to build the KPIs we're focusing on. It is really about storytelling. Now, as enterprise architects, we should be informing people, influencing, motivating people. And the idea behind that is trying to communicate all of this effort we've put into building the business case, gathering that information, and designing the stages that we want to get to. So we can do that usually through these kind of dashboard style environments. We don't really want to be building you know, PowerPoint decks so much anymore. And we don't really want to be sending lengthy Word documents out. We want to make things as tailored as possible for the audience. So we're building specific dashboards, specific views for those stakeholders. And again, of course, these could be internal or external stakeholders as well. So strong dashboards are one of the key things that you want to use to display those types of metrics. Now, when we really think about cloud migration, we can collect the data, we can build the business case, we can design how we're actually going to move to cloud, but we really should then be considering the actual strategies in play for a cloud migration. There are usually six main strategies. Now, a lot of these are ones which kind of fall by the wayside, especially things like retire and retain. And that's almost like you're doing nothing. You're either getting rid of something or keeping it, which likely means you're getting rid of it in a few months or years. But there are some strategies here that we should focus on. Just before focusing on those, this is a quick view of what those plans tend to follow. So you can actually visually see how each of these differ. But one of the important aspects is that first step, discover, assess, prioritize. That's exactly what we'll be doing during the portfolio phase, the design phase. We're trying to determine what we have and how we can actually design a good plan to move to cloud. So this is exactly why coming back to the idea of building proof of concepts is important because we might want to trial various versions of cloud migrations at a smaller scale and then that's crucial for determining things like the feasibility or how quickly we can actually move things to cloud more importantly we're going to be taking a look at the big three so re-hosting re-platforming and refactoring these are traditionally the approaches that will will lead to the, the most, let's say, traditional kind of cloud migration efforts, um, different to retire and retain, of course, which are hopefully self-defining, as we've mentioned. But these are the three strategies that tend to get used the most. Now, all strategies come with their benefits, their risks, and their costs. And so we're going to start by looking at re-hosting. A quick example here is G-Oil and Gas. And they actually optimize their cloud environments. And they roughly save about 30% of their costs simply by just rehosting applications and databases. A significant cost saving for what is usually a low cost impact and low risk. So at times when you're rehosting something, for example, you just might want to move to different providers or move simple things from on-premise to cloud you really are saving money there in various ways, whether it's 
office space that's been taken up or the performance of trying to maintain cooling and heating of those on-premise solutions, rehosting is a great idea. Now, usually this is something that you'll be wanting to do for data migration. And really the drawback here is rehosting is, is really just kind of dipping your feet into the water for cloud migrations. There are some benefits here, of course, it's much quicker. Like I mentioned, there's reduced risk, but that tends to mean reduced reward. And there's usually a broad ecosystems of tools that you can choose to actually help you with rehosting. If we take a look at the second option of replatforming, so replatforming really just means making a few cloud optimizations during that lift and shift or the rehosting platform. So what we really mean by this is if you consider maybe moving um, applications on premise and you're moving to on premise to cloud, what you're trying to do is make small tweaks to that in terms of the platform that's being used. For example, the application that you currently have on premise and the database you have on premise, if you move that to cloud, maybe your cloud provider already provides a fully managed version of that database. And therefore we can actually just re-platform to that fully managed service instead of managing things ourselves within that database. Now this isn't too difficult um, for engineers, I guess, or cloud architects who know what they're doing. Um, and typically this might follow a re-hosting strategy as well, but there are usually immediate benefits around decreasing management costs. And usually what that leads to is some quick rewards around higher availability that tend to match the consumption levels of having on-demand services for users. So replatforming might act as almost like that middle option. We're really just trying to make use of some of the aspects of cloud, which inevitably wouldn't have been the case if we just stayed on premise. And then finally, we have refactoring. So this is the one that comes with the biggest reward here. And refactoring really is about starting from the ground up almost. And what we might classify this is trying to build cloud native applications or databases. So really what we're trying to do is make use of full cloud services, things like AWS Lambda, for example. These are some of the services that cloud providers will give us to refactor their entire applications that we've been using. Now, the biggest advantage, of course, of refactoring legacy applications is it leads into other areas where we can make adjustments, not just leveraging all the services that cloud has, but also splitting that application up into smaller services that we can more easily manage as well. And the key difference when an application is refactored is it's not just you know, only the data that's pulled from cloud storage, but the analysis of that as well is usually on cloud. So the computations, the analytics, that can also be done within those cloud environments. Naturally, such a big project or program comes with benefits and also its risks. Typically, there's longer term cost reductions here. And there's, of course, an increase in resilience across these systems that we're building. We're building them from the ground up to leverage the most modern technology, the modern services that are out there. So that means we can be much more responsive to some of the events that are happening within the world. And really, this is exploiting the full aspects of cloud innovation. So those really are the three options, or the three main options, let's say, when it comes to some of the strategies that you might be thinking of for cloud migration. However, it is important to come back to this word optimize. Now, earlier on, I showed a graph of the costs of on-premise versus cloud. One of the reasons cloud costs tend to be so high at the beginning is because there's little optimization that's been done over time. When you do tend to choose one of those strategies to move things to from on-premise to cloud, usually it's optimized all the way. So it's usually an iterative process where you are trying to tweak the services that you're offering. And that's much easier to do in a cloud environment because all of those services are at your fingertips. Whereas on-premise, you're much more locked into the areas that you're working in. And so operation and optimize is a key factor when it comes to these migration projects. Now, from an architect's perspective, what does this actually look like? Well, beyond the actual migration itself, 
you'll want to make sure that you continually update the data from that portfolio management exercise. You want to make sure that you can monitor this as well. So making sure that it's available, monitoring all the information that's coming into these architects on architectures, and then conducting these kind of what if or trade off scenarios. So really for these cloud migration efforts as well, when you are trying to build these within architecture tools, that's where you have the benefit of building these current states and future states. You can actually start highlighting what are the benefits. So are there you know, ongoing operational requirements that we need in these services that we're building? Maybe there are new cloud technologies coming in, so we can start building future states to reflect that. Having all of this on one page that we can monitor also helps us prioritize some of these migrations. Some migrations might fail, and that's where you can actually start leveraging the idea that you have modeled one of these states, and we can keep it as a historical state, so a reference architecture as such. And this is again a really important factor to consider. When you go through a piece of work and it's a failure, or perhaps you've maybe missed something in that piece of work, always keep a historical context of it, because it's very likely that the same initiative will come up in the future, and at least this way you have a documented reason and version of what you've tried before and hopefully those pitfalls that you avoid in the future as well. And finally, of course, you want to continually update the metrics in here, whether that is again around the security that we're man managing in here, the various risks that we've identified in the organization. You want to make sure that there's co-ownership of this and it's continually being updated. Now, our roles as an architect, though, really is about making the invisible visible. And that is the role an architect should play. Really, when you think about an enterprise architect, there are, of course, touch points across the entire organization. So we should be thinking about the various views that we can produce for these users, the various information that we're providing. We might be allowing users to drill down into this content to know more about specific systems or integrations or databases that we have. And so your goal as an architect is really to listen, observe, understand, sympathize, empathize. Your role is to be there to not only control the work that's going on from a technology perspective, but also deal with the people within those projects and programs as well. You have to develop strong relationships both with your cloud architects, your business analysts, anyone in the organization that's going to be part of these migration efforts to make sure that that vision is clear. So it's an imperative point here, really do need to start communicating the work that's going on to make sure people do understand what they're gaining from either giving you information or working alongside you as well. Another aspect here is coming back to the metrics. So earlier on, we took a quick look at some of the ideas of capturing things like cost. Um, some of the financial metrics in there would also span across hosting, SLAs, licensing, and there are a whole bunch of other metrics that we might want to capture as well. And I mentioned it doesn't all have to be manual, and that was the case of importing data, so building on the integrations that you have. But it also doesn't have to be manual when it comes to actually understanding the data building the analysis around that data. The view that you're actually seeing on the screen here is a, is a reference capability map, specific capabilities that an organization has. And really, if we ask the question of well, which capability should we be focusing on, that might be a difficult question to answer. But keep in mind, during that portfolio management phase, we've gathered information about the systems we use, the infrastructure we have, the data we hold, the projects that have been running. And all of those have relationships to these capabilities. So we can leverage those relationships and then start aggregating values up and down that stack. And this is imperative again for cloud migration projects. If you're trying to analyze specific systems, you might be maybe focusing on the systems that cost you the most money now, or you're focusing on the systems that have a low reliability score, or those who need to hit a certain threshold for availability based on SLAs. Maybe there are systems that aren't integrated well enough or aren't being delivered to customers in different regions. These metrics and the way we analyze them tend to form some of the strategies that we build. So these could be cost, complexity, the performance of our architecture, 
all of these have implications on the way we do things. So really start scoring some of these key areas, automate some of these calculations, and that will helpfully um, define some of those cloud migration strategies, which we've already looked at. So what's next? Well, so far we've looked at specific cloud migration options. Those typical strategies that I've mentioned, um, these are different routes from, of course, the planning, discovery, designing, and optimizing phases. But there are some other areas that you'll want to consider too. And these have actually been embedded, of course, in some of these slides, which we've gone through. Um, but I do want to quickly call out some of the key areas that we found our customers using Abacus for and how this has helped with various cloud migration projects. So the first is a strategy around security. So cybersecurity is, of course, um, a fast paced environment. Um, I guess one of the things I tend to say is don't confuse security with compliance, you know, just because you're compliant, um, that doesn't necessarily mean you're secure. And um, that's an initial pitfall I think a lot of organizations might fall into. Just because you are compliant to specific regulations, that isn't necessarily an indicator that you're secure as an organization. So security and risk, of course, then is, of course, under the organization's control. So those regulation compliance that come through are almost like forced um, committing, but really you as an organization should be managing and controlling security. This of course works alongside cloud migration when we talk about risks, you should be creating risk assessments, risk strategies, and differentiate this slightly from security. You know, IT shouldn't be just responsible for security, they need to talk to the operations team, they also need to highlight where there's risks for not innovating, maybe not adopting new technologies. This is maybe what we call the opportunity cost. So security strategy is obviously a key thing. Um, and more importantly for showing this slide is also just to highlight a previous customer um, webinar from a company called Sophos, who are the UK's leading uh, cybersecurity company. And essentially they've been using Abacus to monitor risks and security too. Now, building one of these risk registers, and you can see by the flow of information here, and how we've talked about cloud migration strategies is almost exactly the same process. We're trying to define this business case, we're collecting that data, we're building and designing these algorithms, and then we're refining or optimizing. And it's this route, which is obviously a key thing to consider across any use case that we're working on. So make sure specifically from this previous WebEx, that you take account of having that information into your, at hand, building a central source of that information, working with different lines of business to collect that information, and then continually improve and optimize on top of that. We also quickly touched on dashboarding. Um, the main reason for dashboarding, again, is for the communication efforts. We are really just trying to communicate the work that we're doing. You know, no project or program we work on should really be in isolation, um, more evidently by cloud migration projects, which affect almost everyone in the organization, whether it's the systems they use, the new training we have to put in place, the new systems and security training there, the cost differences in different departments, things moving from CapEx to OpEx, you know, all parts of the organization are very likely affected by a cloud migration project. So if we can display this on a specific dashboard for those users, that's exactly what we need to do. And dashboards really are just then a collection of these views. So we might have a dashboard showing the alignment between business and IT. These dashboards cover, of course, things like the systems that are in play, the processes that they're using, the capabilities that they're supporting. And for one audience, this is perfectly fine. For another audience, Maybe they are really interested in risk. Maybe we should be showing them that the current risk profile of our current state is around 20% in this case, but we are working towards a target state that reduces the impact of those risks. Whether that's through data security projects we're working on, cloud migration projects, decommissioning specific systems that have high risk profiles. These are all areas which can feed into other use cases. And this is just one of the reasons for wanting to use something like an EA tool. So again, importantly, build dashboards 
for the relevant audience. Don't show everyone everything. Make sure you're tailoring that information to that audience. And then one final comment from me really here is, and hopefully what you'll leave today, is the idea behind cloud migration is that you should be thinking about all of these things on the screen here. Now, optimize, 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 hopefully is one of the key ones, especially when we come to things like reducing costs. But these are all areas within an organization that should be prompting questions. How does an application scale? What operational changes are there? How do we actually train new people? How do we ensure security is by design and not just an afterthought? Now, these are all areas that help manage cost and risk when it comes to a cloud transformational project. And again, remember, the migration itself is not the goal. It's what the migration does for you. That's the goal. So thank you everyone for your time. Um, hopefully you've gained some insight into the ways that cloud migration can be useful for you. Um, if there are any further details that you require, anything that we've shown today, any of the statistics, any of the slides that will be provided at the end, or any useful content, um, please feel free to reach out. And um, there's a lot of content that we have from previous customers and similar situations to what we've described today. The Open Group itself also has some really good resources on cloud migration projects. There's also some good historical context ones on there as well. So it'll give you an idea then of you know, potentially things what were thought about 10 years ago compared to today. Um, so always look through those resources and do reach out if you do have further information on anything that we have covered today. With that, I think that should lead to some questions, hopefully. Yes, thank you very much, Andrew. That was a very insightful presentation. Um, we have had a lot of questions for you in the Q&A facility, so I will pass you over now to Steve Philp, my colleague, who will be asking you some of the questions. We will have a hard stop on the hour. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, very good presentation as, as usual. Um, we've got, as uh, Ollie said, we've got uh, quite a lot of questions, so we'll we'll try and get through as many as we can before the, uh, the end of the session. And then I guess if we have any that we don't get to, uh, we can we can send them to you offline and, and see if we can answer them then. Um, but yeah, just to start off, the first one is from um, Eric. Can you give some real world examples of cloud migration failures? How quickly can these be identified and corrected? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I mean, usually cloud migration itself in terms of, of why things fail, obviously there, there can be many reasons for that. Um, usually there might be things like um, the dependency one I mentioned earlier on. That's usually the case where people are trying to migrate things without an understanding of its dependencies across the organization. So whether that's you know, migrating databases that are required across different applications, that might be one of the main things. The other is also around the migration approach. So it's quite tempting, I guess, to just kind of do like a lift and shift, moving things straight to cloud, but really jumping on that really has the potential to be quite you know, perilous. I mean, for a lot of these things, when you're not making any changes to the service or system and you're purely just moving it to cloud, a lot of the time there's missed opportunity there. So, so really there are kind of special cases where you should be thinking, are we um, needing to have a combination of these migration strategies as well? Um, in terms of real world examples, um, we can try and send some of those through to you if you like. Um, I won't try and name and shame too many organizations on the call. Um, but I think that the key thing there, though, is there have been failures and you can easily find those and see how and why they failed. Um, a lot of the time it could be down to cost, you know, not understanding what the cost actually was up front. That's usually a very quick one to stop any cloud migration effort once people know what the cost is. Um, so usually that's one of the key things there to consider. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. Um, here's another question from Ranjith, uh, quite a long one, but um, while there's a benefit in portability for access, is there not an inherent lack of portability and risk of lock-in and therefore of unexpected higher costs as companies use native cloud tools in their move to cloud 
and find themselves unable to move workloads. And he says in banking, he sees there's a problem with the forthcoming Digital Operational <coughs> Resiliency Act. Yeah, I mean, so I'll, maybe I'll just not sure about the um, the specific resiliency act that's coming in. My my colleagues will probably know more on the finance department, but the lock in aspect is is interesting. I mean, lock in I guess has been a concern. Maybe it was more of a concern previously because you'd be tied into maybe a specific um, public cloud provider, um, and it might be difficult then to move away. And suddenly you realise costs are spiralling, and you, you're kind of stuck in that situation. That's becoming a bit rarer these days, um, specifically around cloud providers where you're using something like a containerization approach as well. Lock-in really isn't a problem for the vendor. You know, if you're using containerization and, and I'm kind of you know, grouping all the applications and services that you use together, um, using something like Docker, for example, means you can just move cloud providers. And whether you are moving cloud providers, that means you can push things back to maybe private clouds perhaps or take a bit more of a hybrid approach to cloud so locking becomes a bit less of a concern but it should still be a concern that's modeled out so trying to provide an example of well what happens if we reach a stage where we feel like we're locked in comes back to the security slide i showed just towards the end which is have an exit strategy you know what are we going to do if we feel like we're going to be locked in and as long as you're planning for those situations that typically then can help um, alleviate some of the concerns around blocking. Um, it's very likely different in different industries as well, but certainly with the technology that's around these days, lock-in for a specific vendor um, becomes a bit rarer. Excellent, thank you. Uh, another question here from uh, Marcello, who says, um, when and how do you test what you've done so far for a go-live date? Um, how do you make sure the integration is working and users can access the applications? If you do this, you'd have to switch all the traffic from production to the new cloud environment transparently. Yeah, it's a it's a good question. I mean, this is really where you'll you'll need a, a good cloud architect internally, of course, and the risks are different depending on the strategy as well. So if you take something like if you take something like the refactoring approach as an example, where we have an on-premise application and we're looking to move it to cloud in terms of completely redesigning the system. You're there in a situation where you can continually be providing services because you have the on-prem app, but at the same time, because you're refactoring, all the testing can be done in cloud. And until that's ready, that's when you can turn off the on-premise application. And there are always gonna be situations where that's the case. Most of it, of course, comes down to good planning um, but there are always going to be caveats to be made for things like downtime as well. So again, it comes back to balancing that risk. You know, if there is downtime, maybe you're aware of it. Um, those integrations, of course, might need to be tested. But you could always try to replicate the functionality within a cloud environment without, of course, first switching off the services that you have. Um, so yes, I, I would recommend that obviously having a good architecture team or a good cloud architect who can help with those types of situations inherently come back down to that balance of risk. You know, there is inevitable risk in moving things and turning things off and setting new services up. And um, that's just something that we hopefully have to manage. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you for that. Another one now from Amy. How do we manage the trade offs between different cloud migration strategies? Yeah. So, we quickly touched on, or I've certainly stated very quickly in those slides, current state and future state. And what I really mean by that is we model different architectures. So modeling different architectures really just means modeling different scenarios. So if we're building, let's say, an architecture for each cloud migration strategy that we have, and we end up with six architectures, each with their own migration strategy, what that means is that we can then do a trade-off analysis. So, for example, one cloud migration effort might increase our costs, but maybe decrease the complexity. Another architecture that we're working on might increase our reliability and efficiency, but it reduces our time to market because switching on those services is going to take longer. And the idea is that those architectures exist for that trade-off scenario. We should be comparing those metrics that we've calculated. Um, again, I guess going back to 
making sure you're only comparing the metrics that are important to you for that specific use case, whether that is cost, risk, resiliency, complexity, choose the metric that's important and use that as the trade-off scenario. It's also common across other use cases, not just cloud migration. You know, if you're looking at things like um, compliance metrics, you know, you're building architectures to see how you can be more compliant, whether that's new regulations that are coming into play, what the plans for making ourselves more reliant. Also things like security. Security is a key one. Maybe we have applications that are unsecure and our architectures that we're building have different phases. Maybe one is decommissioning the app, complete room removes the risk and security is increased. Or in this case, we're moving it to cloud. Inherent security in cloud means that there's gonna be an increase in security there as well. So the strategy that you use, the architectures that you use, that's really where you perform those trade-off scenarios to understand which option is best. Um, and that's essentially why you'd use architectures. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew, for that. Um, got a few more. I mean, we've got a lot more questions. Thank you. squeeze in a few more. Um, Adam says, based on the obsolescences of our data center, we're forced to do a lift and shift cloud migration. What advice would you have to accelerate a cloud optimization strategy to balance risk and cost? Okay, yeah. So, um, one of the things there, which is probably not the best answer you're going to receive, but we'd have to obviously speak to you and see um, what situation you're in in terms of the, the kind of advice that we can give you there to kind of accelerate some of the cloud um, strategies. But some of the, the quick tips there on balancing risk and cost is to, again, just model those different situations that we've talked about. And if you are kind of forced maybe to do a lift and shift from a cloud migration perspective, see what benefits that can bring. Now, earlier on, I mentioned specific organizations who have moved to cloud by a lift and shift and saved a significant proportion um, of revenue there. So it doesn't always have to be, you know, a low reward for just a lift and shift. A lot of it depends, like you've mentioned there, on the balance between risk and cost. For specific organizations, it also comes down to your appetite for risk. Some organizations are more prone to take risks than others. And therefore, the payoffs might be larger, but the downfalls will be larger too. And so for that specific situations, one of the best things we can do is potentially just reach out to you. We'll have a conversation, maybe show you how Abacus can help in these specific situations and give you some advice there. Um, but yeah, apologies, that might not be the most direct answer to your question, um, but we'll certainly, of course, follow up with you on that one. Okay, great. Um, a few questions from Jan, so uh, I'll squeeze this one in. It's, um, could you provide an example of enforcing specific security control in the design or operations, for example, in the IAM area, and how are corresponding risks mitigated? Uh, yeah, so I mean, around um, identity access management, there are different kind of access controls that you might want to put in place there. Um, so, I mean, generally, of course, you have things like you know, rule based access to things, physical access control, role based access. You know, all of these are different ways that we can try and, let's say, enforce those controls around IAM. Um, I guess it depends on your user base and the systems that you're applying those to as well. Um, typically, if you're working through those controls, um, you might want to be looking and investigating into specific frameworks as well that can help. Um, so, for example, um, NIST is a great framework there that you can utilize, which has various levels of access controls and various other controls across other security areas as well. So maybe look at the system that you're working on um, and how you might enforce those controls for those different users. And again, explicitly maybe here in the design and the operation of that system. So if the system already exists, of course, there could be benefits for moving to cloud because you're utilizing maybe some of the in-design security mechanisms there, especially things like um, MFA and single sign-on. Those are how you can maybe mitigate some of the risks around security. Um, again, it's dependent on the system, but look at security related architectures and frameworks and reference models like NIST and SABSA. Those can give you a good understanding of how those controls can be put into action as well. 
Brilliant. And in talk of frameworks, I've got, we, we can just squeeze this one last sure. question from Larry, who says, how helpful do you find the open group framework, TOGAF, when it comes to cloud migration? Oh, that's a very apt question, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I, you answer that, but yes. <laughs> I mean, so very useful. I mean, the key thing to think, and we've mentioned this before around TOGAF, you know, treating TOGAF as a, as a toolbox to be used here. Now, if you look back through these slides and at the same time look through the TOGAF documentation, you'll find a lot of the stuff we've talked about correlates to different phases in TOGAF anyway. We're defining the architecture vision and the baseline. We're collecting the information. There are design phases that we're going through and each one is iterative and its levels of optimization throughout. So TOGAF becomes really important as a framework for cloud migration. I mean, so do other frameworks as well. Again, it's about making sure that you use aspects from those frameworks that are suitable. You know, if you're going to, on day one, say, we're going to use the entirety of TOGAF for this cloud migration project, I'd probably just suggest taking a step back and thinking, well, what phases of TOGAF are going to be the most useful for designing these strategies? We don't need to use all of TOGAF. We can use aspects of it to help us design these new states in time. Now, TOGAF itself and the Open Group have a lot of resources where they talk about cloud migration and TOGAF too. So I highly recommend taking a look at those and that will hopefully give you a more comprehensive answer than I can give in the last 30 seconds on this call, but certainly very helpful um, and usually in combination as well with other frameworks, with other reference models and with other notations as well. Great, thanks uh, Andrew for, uh, for answering all those questions. We didn't quite get through them all. There was a lot of questions, but um, thanks very much for that. Is there anything you want to say, final comments before we sign off for the event? Just a, a final thank you, I guess, to everyone and, and you guys, of course, for, for hosting this and, and setting this session up. Um, for all those questions we couldn't answer, and we will make sure we get back to you um, on each of those. And as usual, we'll be providing the slides as well. Um, if there's anything else, of course, feel free to get in touch. Um, but once again, yeah, thank you everyone for your time today. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Andrew, for your uh, your time too, and for everybody who attended. And uh, we hope to see uh, see you all again on future uh, webinars from from the Open Group. So uh, with that, thanks again, and uh, and goodbye from us. Thank you.